in the Olympic Stadium in front of 80,000 people, watched by millions. Don't f*** this up. Are you crazier than David Goggins? <laughs> Richard Whitehead, MBE, is a winner. He's also the world record holder for double amputation in both marathon and half marathon. So I've got four Paralympic medals, four times world champion, four times European champion, ran 79 marathons. Not many athletes have broken 23 seconds over 200 metres, as well as running sub three hour marathons. With no legs. Yeah, that's right. With real mental strength, with real purpose, backed by data-driven planning, he shares the critical ingredients to become a leader and deliver in any circumstance. You just have to think, why not? The opportunity is there, why wouldn't you take it? Because somebody else will if you don't. The light in my head was going, am I gonna settle for second here or am I gonna push on to finish? And literally at that point it was, I am emptying the tank and to see how far I can go. Now he speaks on stages around the world and inspires millions of people to achieve great things. What have been some of your biggest challenges that you've had then? Changing my mindset from being a young disabled boy to dominate the world of Paralympic sport. When the time's right, you step forward, you take responsibility, have ownership of your life, your performance, your chance, and live life to the full. Remember to hit that follow button right now. Let's do this. I said to myself, don't doubt me. I, I know what I can do and I'm gonna show you. Let's talk about elite performance, all right? So. What makes elite performance? I think for me, it's it, it's very personal. And um, when I look at my career, it's obviously had some challenges and obstacles and being a disabled person has, has added to that. But um, we all have aspirations in life. We all have a journey to take. And as part of that journey, you have performance goals, you have opportunities, you have expectations of yourself and others and for me it's performance means the ability to um when the time's right uh i've got a tattoo that says cometh the hour cometh the man <laughs> when the um the platform's right you you take that opportunity with all the tools that you developed in life uh and give it 110 percent when the opportunity comes you give it all you've got everything everything is yeah it? everything and 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 um when we look at performance teams when we look at performance people they they sometimes are put together with um with the wrong initial thought process for me when i put teams together it's been about value how those individuals add value to my journey, add value to my performance, and then in return, I can, with my performance, I can add value to their lives as well. It's it's a two-way process that I always feel I can add value to other people's performance. Hence the reason why I do a lot of mentoring uh, and support myself. But for performance, the raw, the rawity of performance for me is the ability to shine under pressure the ability to express yourself on on the big stage and when when you bring your mission statement to the table you're able to deliver that under any circumstances yeah i like a number of things that you said so come of the come off the hour come off the man yeah that's so me, you've got yeah. that tattoo where yeah. have you got uh, am i allowed to ask where you've got <laughs> yeah, tattoo no, it's not in a private place believe okay. me it's, it's on my, my arm so right there we go i had it i had it done when i was 21 and uh at that time you obviously you have yeah, whether experiences uh tattoos whatever you kind of you don't realize how poignant those those decisions are uh, and, and for me it really does sum up who i am come with the hour come with the man means when the time's right you step forward uh you take responsibility you have ownership of your your life your performance your your chance and live life to the full now controversial this one have you ever not taken the opportunity have you ever not taken that moment no i'm thinking uh, with my 
disability being in some people's eyes a real hindrance around opportunities i think other people in in my community uh, of nottingham where i'm from or maybe in work stroke sporting life maybe have made those opportunities really hard to accept and right. really hard to um, deliver i feel that i'm comfortable being uncomfortable and because of that i throw myself into how how are you though how did that come about it's through experiences it, the the discrimination that people with disabilities uh, have to overcome the uh, the aspirations that other people put on you because you you're different and then having role models mentors people you look up to in your life that can guide you through some of those challenging situations what well, what's been have, have you ever used that as an excuse mm. has it ever come up no i wouldn't say that i've used it as an excuse um we learn more about ourselves in adversity for sure success uh, for me as somebody that's a professional athlete is more about delivering my training in a competitive environment so that is what so when that goes right the learning processes there are that i've done everything that, that i could do i've done everything right but when it goes wrong that's when the learning process is around have i got the right people around me was I committed enough? Uh, was I dedicated to the cause? Was the cause something I believed in? Really understanding what my why was, and that that for me is 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 the big the big opportunity when you go through that adversity. So going back to your question around have I have I not taken those? Have I not taken that opportunity or? I think I think for me I I just throw myself into those those uncomfortable positions because I want to learn more about uh, the diverse world we live in. Um, I'm a massive EDI um, ambassador for the brands, the stakeholders, the sports I, I I I work with, and that's that's important that you have role models within those areas, but also. We, we don't know it all we we haven't experienced it all so put yourself in those vulnerable environments really just challenge our thought process our our mission and for me it also starts to sculpture who i am as a person and people see me running marathons breaking world records on the track and paralympic gold medalist running 40 marathons in 40 days etc they see those sporting triumphs but they don't realize the humanitarian work that i've done in the past the work that i do with the homeless lgtq plus etc etc um and they, those those experiences really mold who i am and and the reason why i value life so highly look take your opportunities what a powerful sort of takeaway that is right now just for you know that that's what I'm getting from you. Yeah, for sure. And um, those opportunities, when that, that door opens, however wide that door is, it's about maximising that, that opportunity. And that opportunity might be to engage with a different kind of community that has a different thought process. I know friends and family, work colleagues, athletes that feel uncomfortable with that because maybe those individuals don't think like you or don't have the same methodology as you for me that's a, an opportunity of enrichment and i've always been open to that i think communication is really key in performance the ability to communicate with a vast amount of people from from different uh religions sexualities uh countries uh, and I do that through the power of sport. So I don't do why, that. Why is that important for anyone in life? Um, a representation. I think for me, uh, the, the ability to communicate with with people through a means, and I do that with sport. 
and that that's why sport is so powerful for me because people see what I do and then relate it to some of their challenges in life. They also see what I do and want to know how I've overcome some of the adversity that I have. But then also see that I've overcome so much uh, through my performance that they they have hope and aspirations for themselves. So it's very relative. And I also don't communicate just to the disability community. I communicate through, through v- visual, kind of through, obviously... Hmm. Um, with with a variety of different people, that they kind of take a nugget of who I am and go, actually, that's 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 where I relate to that person, and I keep those doors open. I know whether some people don't, and they're very insular with their their line of communication. But I like to, when people reach out to me, I like to uh, communicate. I like to. Um, to answer those questions however insignificant they may may feel at the time but to that individual it might be a real kind of life-changing point of reference what have been in your life some of your biggest challenges that you've had then um probably bit the big challenges are changing my mindset from being a young disabled boy that was um, that was sporty that didn't really have direction with employment how or, young um probably um in my like teens um having a friendship group that was very working class friendship group um not very aspirational um to then going i'm using this platform within sport to to dominate the world of paralympic sport what to... how did you make that change um i was inspired by an athlete called Terry Fox, a uh, Canadian athlete, that um, he was a cancer sufferer, lost one of his legs. And I saw this film in the late 80s, the Terry Fox story. He gave me that role model that I really needed regarding, I didn't really see anybody that was like me or had the mindset that I had to be able to utilize my impairment or disability as a resource not a challenge and that's what's really important and i talk about that a lot about resourcefulness of people with disabilities not challenges and obstacles because obviously they are negative and terry through his story really did kind of relate to the the challenges that people with disabilities have he lost his leg due to sarcoma uh he was in um rehabilitation in canada and within a hospital environment and he wants to run a marathon a day uh across canada to raise money for sarcoma research so cancer research and everybody within that environment really doubted his his process of doing it and the the ability to do it he showed that the power of the mind that he really set himself that massive challenge and then went after it. Unfortunately, Terry Fox, like like we know with some cancers, cancer does come back and he got secondary sarcoma and on his journey wasn't able to finish. So he, he actually died, unfortunately. But through that work, he's raised over $800 million for, yeah, for cancer research. He's one of the massive um, public figures in, in Canada for not just sport, for... Uh, activism wow. yeah, regarding charity so he's he you watched that in your teens and I thought fucking hell this is awesome <laughs> yeah I just like for me it was if you hadn't have watched that would things be different now see I, I don't know I don't know whether we, we we do things for a reason clearly um but it's also about surrounding yourself with like-minded people. Yeah. Um, 
And if you're stuck in an environment that's not progressive, then whatever form of life you're in, then you're always going to be in that slow lane. It's about how do you get out of that slow lane to uh, be uncomfortable, get in that middle lane and kind of not necessarily pass people, take people on, on, on you with that journey, but also have that, that learning experience. And I think with with the Terry Fox story, it gave me the aspirations that I needed. My, my parents always saw the power of sport being something a young person with a disability in uh, a mainly white village in Nottingham, so not very diverse at all, that sport could could open up a lot of doors. And, um, and that it did. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah, for sure. And I, I still feel I've, I've got a massive amount to offer like uh, within running and outside running but I also feel that the experiences I've had uh, the broad experiences that I've had really do enrich my message around what is actually possible well what you def you defy possibility really I mean so you can sprint yeah and you can do marathons yeah that's it that's it and and not not many if any athletes have broken 23 seconds over 200 meters as well as running sub three hour marathons um i'm passionate about sport generally and but ju ju just a second just for yeah. reference so everybody knows so um i'm sure that people are going to go and watch watch the clips of yeah it. yeah my 200 meters at london 2012 yeah 200 meters i mean it's impressive isn't it because you're behind you had a slow start and then all of a sudden poof, yeah that's awesome 23 seconds with no legs yeah that's right so i was born with my disability and as we know with impairments and disabilities you're either you, you get it from birth which is congenital an accident or an illness and there's lots of challenges and obstacles within the, all those three processes of having an impairment, whether that's um, physically, uh, obviously psychological, uh, emotional and economic. And uh, for, for me, like, I've, I've always kind of saw a challenge as something that if I want to go for it, why not? And... Um, Again, that's why I always kind of preach to people I talk to about aspirations in life. We've all got a gift and it's about trying to nurture that gift with, with like-minded people or an environment of enrichment. And that's, um, and that's really important. It's about having that environment to grow. And obviously London 2012, in 2005 when it was announced, going back a little bit, I remember sitting down with my marathon coach at the time, who's who's still my marathon coach, sorry, Liz Yelling, uh, and her husband, Martin, um, and we talked about London 2012. And we talked about, and even in 2005, look, there's a great opportunity to shine in London. How do we get there? And um, I was running marathon, starting my marathon journey at that stage. Uh, ran a lot of marathons all over the world, whether it was like the Middle East, a lot in America, Europe, etc., Africa, and um, was starting to gain some real momentum in in the marathons. And I love that event. It's it's such a inclusive event where if you're running six hours or two hours, you still get the same medal and you still have the re real same experience of success. But we looked at the, the competition schedule for, for London 2012 and there wasn't my event within uh, that structure. And disability sports about classification. So you're, you're paired with or you compete against uh, athletes that have similar impairments. Yeah. So whether it's amputees or people with cerebral palsy, learning, sensory disabilities. And we looked at the programme, there wasn't a marathon, there wasn't a half marathon, there wasn't 10k. That The longest distance event that I could compete at in London 2012 was the 200 metres. So going from being like 59 kilos, quite scrawny uh, endurance athlete, all the way to 
going to London 2012, 76 kilos. Really? Yeah. 17 kilograms. Yeah, yeah. In that time, I'd put on a lot of muscle and I'd become a a powerful athlete because I felt that that, that, those were the the things I needed to work on. Uh, I needed to have the... The infrastructure, the tools, the 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 uh, the makeup to be able to deliver the performance I wanted to at London 2012, and um, yeah. So at that time, I'd already been marathon world record holder, so I'd ran 2:42 in Chicago in 2009, uh, and the fastest ever marathon runner on prosthetics, whether it's two or one or above knee or below knee. And at that stage, it was kind of, now I need to be serious. If I want to be serious with London 2012, I need to make that transition. So, yeah, lots of chicken and eggs. Uh, obviously, transition more time towards the track. Then had a, mar- uh, a marathon coach. But then she was like, well, really, you need to have a sprints coach as well. So Keith Antoine, who coached Catherine Mary bronze medalist at Sydney Games over 400 metres he came into the team really worked with me around the transition between being a pace athlete to being an explosive athlete at the track and yes it take, took, took me obviously a lot of time like you'll see on the on the clip on YouTube um, but it was all about the finish and the ability to finish off the uh, the race how I did was a lot of hard work and I celebrated like that at the finish and it was more about celebration of triumph right. and that I've had to come through so many obstacles and challenges to be to, to have that platform for success but I never let it never let those challenges really stop me or or divert from my real journey which London 2012 was never about winning it was just about giving my, myself that platform to express myself in front of millions of people and 80,000 people watch me in the stadium, millions on the TV and uh, it's obviously given me a great platform for doing what I'm doing at the moment. Massive platform. You know, loads of things that you've said in there has resonated. One thing in particular, you said it's all about. it was all about the finish. <laughs> now, in general, because a lot of people start stuff and they don't finish it, is it is showing your best, is it all about the finish? I think that's what the public generally see, though. The public would generally see it's like people that have viral videos and people that are kind of on the TV that are doing great stuff within their their areas. They see the kind of finished article or the yeah. polished article, but don't understand the the tireless hours that go into that preparation, the the sacrifices that other people have to give for you to have that opportunity, and the finish is it, it it's a great kind of polished thing that you can kind of be very proud of and celebrate with a wider audience and i do that a lot with obviously taking my rep medal around but also talking about my my experiences for me it's not for me <laughs> it's uh, people talk about the journey between <laughs> the start and the finish i always say to younger athletes enjoy that process enjoy the journey learn from those experiences and you can get it right but that path isn't always straight there's lots of twists and turns within that path to that finished article and I didn't get my first Paralympic gold medal until I was in my 30s so I'd had a lot of experience within sport whether that's recreational or whether that's uh, in performance sport like I'd been to a Paralympic Games before London 2012 in ice sledge hockey didn't have a great experience the team that I went with weren't functional and because of that gave me that real fire in my belly to say when I have my own personal opportunity nobody is going to affect what happens after that white line you mentioned two other things earlier on you mentioned pressure and big stage let's just look how did you control the pressure to perform then yeah the 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 uh the pressure on London 2012 was like massive. It, if you, as you can imagine, home games. Like my my medal at London 2012 was worth probably about 1.5 million pounds to British Athletics. So yeah, all the athletes that that won in 
London 2012 had real responsibility to deliver um, because of funding for those sports post London and um, you just have to think why not do you know what I mean it's like why why should this just not just before you you know just before the gun's going off how are you controlling yourself how are you remaining calm how are you controlling that process involved? process like you just think of it as for me it was the day itself I, I'm very metronomic with um, how I run in my marathons I'm very metronomic with my my day's preparation towards that race time and that's important to me so I know this needs to happen at this time exactly at half nine or ten o'clock or ten thirty I know what what needs to happen if it doesn't then I'm also dynamic enough to kind of make those alterations but for me when things happen within that process it kind of makes a relevance that this is this is serious now so for instance I normally sit on my own for breakfast I kind of go through some thought processes around I've, is everything set right just feeling relaxed um, just thinking about kind of how much work I've put into this process never really never really visualize the finish I, I when I do my visualization I always visualize up to the how do you visualize yeah when I'm training um, when I'm kind of in the bath kind of just kind of visualizing like the smell the sound the feel of the track the feel of the environment I'm gonna run or compete in and how long do you visualize for at a time probably it were definitely more than a race on the track right <laughs> um, but but sometimes it can be it can be 30 minutes 45 minutes um, so then when that opportunity comes around it's not it's not a new experience it's kind of you've you've kind of been there before and 2012 it was like as I the gun went I was kind of seeing myself um, as a third person from away from my, my actual body it was like really like an outer body experience um, but yeah going back to the start of the day I I sat down with my performance director he kind of muscled his way in and sat down at breakfast and said Richard just to let you know you're our only gold medal hope today so go and smash it and if for some athletes that would add more pressure more responsibility but I think he knew that the kind of athlete I was that that I was his team captain for five or six like world championships I was somebody within the team that that thrived on that responsibility so when he said that it kind of I said said to myself look I'm look don't doubt me I, I know what I can do and I'm going to show you and when I went through my, my process of the day um, the nerves and anxiety it, it can kind of uh, work against athletes but also can work for them for me I just started to start to, as, as I was getting close to my race time started to feel that yeah the importance of what I've got to do but also the the platform that this will give me in the future so as I'm going through my warm-ups so I have my little last chat with my, my coach Keith going to first call everything's a focus everything is clear focus towards get to that start line deliver my parts to my race as though it's in front of one man and his dog at Loughborough University where I train even though it's in the Olympic Stadium in front of 80,000 people watched by millions and as the gun goes I said to myself, so, well, it's take your marks. And I'm, I said to him at that point, don't fuck this up and literally like, and then like deliver. That's it. It's all about delivery. It's about focus <laughs> delivery. And then obviously I was behind, I was eighth until about 120 meters to go, but it was about kind of keeping relaxed. And then- What was going through your free mind at that point? Yeah, just don't panic. Just don't. Uh, patience. So it's quite negative, that isn't it? Don't fuck up. Don't yeah, panic. no, no, no. It's. I think. I think for me, it's about kind of. I understood the. I understood the. Um, the the prospect of what could happen in in twenty plus seconds time, um, but I think that just cleared my mind. Cleared my. It wasn't about a run. 
it was about reactions it was i don't think it was a negative at all i think it was more of a it was a call to kind of action it was about a call to action yeah yeah for sure it was more for me it was a more uh relative to what what i needed to do it this is all about take emotions out of the situation it's about delivery it's about responsibility a lot of people have put a lot of time effort training into that 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 performance and it's about delivery and when i talk to other brands and businesses about the importance of performance having your own gold medal moments performance needs to be emotive too many people get emotionally involved in that performance it's about delivery focus and and that's what i did as as i was coming around the bend I could hear the crowd kind of going, oh, this guy should be winning this race by now. And then all of a sudden, 120, as I'm picking people off, like it was like a jet engine of... It was, it was, it was a same bolt like. Yeah, yeah. And as, yeah, I was co- just... yeah, as I was coming around the bend, it, um, the crowd were like pulling me around. And then obviously there's moments in that, in that process where I was second and the light in my in my head was going look am i going to sec- settle for second here or i'm going to push on to finish and literally it was at that point it was i am emptying the tank and to see how far i can go and again that's that's something that i also talk about with performance it's about don't do enough do everything within performance the ability to shine isn't about being one of many it's about being a driver in life and that's what i wanted to do i wanted to kind of empty the tank show everybody in that stadium that's still 12 year 12 years since that event still talk about that openly about being in the stadium seeing that understanding that that was not just a triumph for richard whitehead but for paralympic sport and that's what i wanted i wanted i wanted the kind of the moment in front of those individuals that could kind of take that away and hopefully inspire their communities to have an impact on their communities through what performance looked like. Don't do don't do enough. Do everything. What, yeah, do everything. It that's it. I think it's empty the tank. Yeah, no, I, I truly believe that, and mm. I I, um, I come across a lot of a lot of people my age, our age, within our, like thirties, forties, coming up to the fifties, feeling that they've done everything they can in life, and it's kind of just coasting in to retirement and for me it's about kind of pushing on you know what i got from you there and I, me included sometimes i hold back and you've got to go for it yeah for sure no you got to leave nothing in the tank yeah yeah for sure you know don't do enough yeah do everything yeah, that yeah. Is such a powerful because you know in the moment you know ready steady this is your moment you know taking your opportunity what you talked about earlier on is that feeling any different for a sales director that's just to go back to go into a room and they've got to perform and close a massive deal is it any different from acting director that's just about to launch the biggest campaign with the biggest investment or a ceo that's got to go and address all of the people and communicate and inspire is it is it any different? Is it exactly the same? No. Focus on delivery. Yeah, no, and I, I also, I also promote to stakeholders and brands around the importance of engaging with performance athletes because they've got the skills, they've got the tools to uh, work in those environments. But again, going back to my performance, imagine having a, an opportunity to deliver a performance that was worth one point five million pounds and you've got four years to deliver that performance and that performance is going to be in front of 80,000 people and it's going to be um, at a certain time in front of millions in the background what are you going to do to make sure you're going to deliver your best performance and that's kind of how I saw it I saw, I saw it as the more pressure, the better, to be honest. Like, and when I'm training, I'm giving every day I'm having gold medal moments. I'm training as though I'm winning. I'm training. And yes, you have the, the, the holes where you're having to dig yourself out of it because 
you're you're tired you're fatigued you're mentally socially um in dark places but you're 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 goal driven it's exactly the same as business the opportunity is there why wouldn't you take it because somebody else will if you don't yeah i wrote down there the power of clear expectations so four years out you you knew exactly yeah what was expected of you on on the night yeah, yeah? exactly it was so clear the the level of expect and you know people perform much much higher when they know exactly what's expected of them yeah you know sure. you're going into the sales meeting what i what what is expected of you now yeah. And you're very, very clear on it. And the clearer you are on it, the easier it becomes. Is that right? Yeah, and, and also the, the team around you is really important with that as well. So when I was putting this team around me, I wanted uh, people that, like I said before, added value. And some of those individuals I didn't literally like to start with. It was like I'm putting... So, for instance, my coach, Keith Antoine, we, we kind of had a little bit of a relationship didn't we weren't close when we first started working together but i know he's data driven he he can tell me exactly what i'm going to run on that day on the track so he would plan a year of training to be able to li- deliver that that time so four years worth of training he could he could uh, deliver that that time with all this training all this preparation and the same with other people, the sports nutritionist that I work with, the sports scientists, all came together uh, as a team to be part of that performance. And and that's what's important as well. The, the opportunity might be there, but have you got the substance to be able to deliver? And knowledge is power. Uh, commitment to the cause is really important. And then on top of that, understanding the bigger kind of sustainable goals of right what's the why the why for me was so to be part of social change to showcase what's possible and the ability to like you say empty the tank and perform on the highest stage i like your point on on the power of data driven planning yeah you know from various coaches that you had it was yeah. all data driven if you hadn't have had that data-driven planning, it's like heads or tails. Really? Yeah, it's like heads or tails. It, it it's uh, it, there's oh, there's, no, there's no justification with performance without that data. I see it all the time. I see I see um, flippancy around performance because of no data. Um, why would you take a chance when you've you've got that opportunity um, that might only come around once in a lifetime? So like, look. The, the majority of people that are watching and listening to this now are not disabled athletes. No, the majority no. of people that listen to this, are, they're either personal development junkies, yeah, yeah, business owners, business leaders, yeah, you know, someone aspiring for something in their own life. All right, you know, data-driven planning. What you just said there is, if you haven't got that. Yes, you're putting you're putting your money on red or black. Yeah, literally. It's, a, it's luck. Yeah, literally. And um, I also talk about relatability as well with performance. Everybody's the reason why we're in this game is to maximise that opportunity. And if the data says that you've you've done the work, there's a possibility there. Um, but we need to work to get there. We need to put the the pieces of the puzzle together to paint that that picture. Then then we go for it. But that data shows confidence, um, honesty, um, trust in the process, and also makes that delivery more. For me, makes that delivery more. Um, enjoyable for the people around you i think when we look at performance how many times do we see performance and we see individuals with with stress anxiety Mm. pressure around that performance for me look at my video from 2012 at the start of it it looks like i'm taking the piss i'm like i'm I'm like waving at people because i know i've done the work i've 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 got 
the mindset that if anybody beats me today, they have trained harder than me for the last four years. And I feel nobody has. I feel that. I feel that. And that confidence isn't just from people around you. That's that confidence of experience within within life and sport. That's a coping strategy, though. That's a stress management technique. You, yeah. you know, you go, you're going into self trust. You're reflecting on what you've done and where you've been from. Yeah. You know, no and the honesty what, and the honesty of, of when it hasn't gone well, you evaluate that appropriately, and you go well, mm. and then move forwards, and then always kind of looking looking forwards as though like for me on the track one step forwards on the track is always a, a step close to the destination and the same with the marathon it's just obviously a lot further but for me putting those building blocks in place has always showed me the right way to go and if you get that curveball you've got the tools that you're able to then go actually that's not worked that person's not really added value i need to get rid of them or make those decisions that I've had to make in the past where clearly some of those team members are not equipped to be able to take you to the next next level. So if that's the case, then what are you going to do? Are you going to stick with them because you've got loyalty? Or or do you think, well, actually, I need to bring somebody else in to support the, the mission? Hence the reason why um, in, um, in 2016 when I went to Rio when I retained my Paralympic um, gold medal, I had to do that. I had to bring somebody else in that I felt would add value in a different area that if not, I probably wouldn't have won. So I, I identified that winning in 2012 was brilliant, gave me a great opportunity, but my why was legacy, and part of that legacy was retaining the title in my 40s. People thought that that was impossible, I was racing against kids, young boys that were half my age. Um, how do I do that? I just go, actually, what is my strengths? Experience, passion, desire, knowledge, and commitment, determination. What And what do I need? I need technical support in certain areas, put that in place then was able to sustain that performance for an extra four years. It's amazing the skills that you've developed. And, you know, earlier on you did say, you know, part of the reason why businesses like to bring athletes and uh, people who've performed exceptionally like you have in, into is because of the skills and tools they've got now. Yeah, for sure. The, the skill, any top performer has got the ability to manage stress. You know, you show yeah. me you show me a top performer, I'll, we, we, you'll find that they have got the ability to manage that and cope yeah. with that. So that is a skill that's been developed. Now, you were chosen as the team captain for six years, you said. Yeah, yeah. Was that because you were the best or was it because you had something else? Relatability to, um, to other athletes, challenges, obstacles, kind of showed the way of performance. Uh, I think behaviours, having those performance behaviours, the voice, the voice of a leader, which I wouldn't say that I put myself forwards as a leader, but other people identify me as one because of my my behaviours that I have within that performance environment. What, Experience what as well. What were behaviours in the performance environment that, that people were seeing and observing? Calmness, uh, professionalism, the ability to deliver within any circumstances, whether that's uh, environmental differences, whether that's physical changes, whatever. I think people relate to what I've done because they see it's possible and obviously with a leader, being able to communicate that with. I I also think that when we look at leaders, sometimes we're a little bit kind of fo really focused on that, um, that team talk, that mm. one kind of team talk that that resonates with the team and it really kind of buoys people up. And I I always think that leadership is about if you've got twenty people in that room. If you're not relating to 20 people, then you're failing. 
for me it might start with a real call to action but then it's more about getting to know the the cogs in the process so knowing everybody and knowing how to motivate everybody within that team is is even more important and that's what i think they think that's what like i say the the performance manager peter erickson which initially doubted me uh put so many restrictions in in place of me he was the one that 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 gave me those leadership opportunities and um we've got that mutual respect because of that and i remember as again again back to 2012 finishing my lap of honor and then gave my 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 coach keith a hug and he was actually with Peter Erickson at the time and I said to Peter straight off the track never doubt me and he said I didn't I said no you did never doubt me and it, he, he, I, he probably didn't but he it was his way of communicating to well, he, he, somebody he, like myself to get the best out of me and he did and it worked yeah for sure yeah for sure and different different um, ways of communicating and this is why communication is so important different ways of communicating are important because we are not all robots we are not all uh, made from the same cloth we all, all have different experiences whether you're a double egg amputee or another double egg amputee we're all different and um, in life everybody whether you're listening or watching this will be affected by disability that's one thing that we have we are all having in connection and this is why I talk about paying it forward in regarding getting to know the real resourceful enough resourceful enough of people with disabilities but also understanding how performance relates within that resourcefulness as well and and for me it it's a it's a skill set that i've developed over time i still am and through the experiences that i've had with a vast amount of stakeholders over the last like 15 years I'm learning from uh, brands, organisations that are international, uh, national, regional brands that make mistakes, or I'm I'm kind of getting those like nuggets of of performance. I'm going actually that nugget that 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 international brand are working with. I can use that in my my local with my localised team. So it 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 those those skills those that knowledge is transferable all the way down that 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 pyramid to your front facing stuff you just shared some incredible ingredients of what to look out for a leader calmness professionalism the ability to de deliver under any circumstances being able to relate to people all people that I mean start you, you you said you can start with a call to action but you've got to know every cog in the process what you driven by what you driven by what's your role so there's, a, there's an element of detail there in becoming so incredible ingredients of a leader and I can see that you've got that now you've also done 40 marathons in 40 days yeah. <laughs> which is crazy really isn't it are you crazier than David Goggins <laughs> no I'm not I'm definitely not crazier than David Goggins I think I um, <laughs> he, he's got legs yeah I know yeah um, I think the word possibility is something that um we all undermine, we all have the possibility in life, we all have the opportunity, we all have a desire to be better. And I think that that opportunity for me has initially came because people were saying, you've got no legs, you, you could be a swimmer, play wheelchair basketball, there's no possibility of you running or the barriers and obstacles for that were massive and I kind of take it as a real real opportunity in respect that because of that I'm going to see how far I can go with it so obviously I started running and the marathon thing because of Terry Fox was really powerful but I, I then said well why can't I do a challenge such as Terry running a marathon a day and Land's End's John O'Groats again get would give me a great platform to show that not only can I just run a marathon but I can run consecutively but I saw that challenge and when I talk about this to people they, they say I'm crazy I saw that challenge as just a day's work 
in my day's work, what did I have to do? I had to get up in the morning, had my my um, media requirements that I had to do. I had to uh, have my warm up uh, and then run 42 kilometers or 26 miles. That's all I had to do in the day. And then recover appropriately to then get up the next day and then deliver again. So whether you're going into work delivering that with that high performance team or having to physically deliver a high performance performance on the road it's very similar and utilizing your body as a machine and mentally and physically keeping active i feel it are completely different because mentally um we need to be strong we need to be di- uh, dynamic physically we can train ourselves to, to be able to do anything and i feel that challenges wise limitless we we have um we have an opportunity to push the boundaries like people like david goggins etc do that through through their experiences whether that's in the marines or whether it's having a disability like mine but don't put limits on yourself feel that uh if if you're passionate in that area to drive on and within it that's that's business whether that's that's physically and sometimes through trauma people through trauma through having like a a life-threatening illness or condition or accident then go and do these crazy challenges like climb everest or do 40 miles why, why do you think days. that is do you think perspectives change because because going back to one of my kind of what key kind of understandings is that we don't value life until something like that really does happen we don't value the that one of my friends um simon mellows died from sarcoma in 2005 and i used to play cricket with simon and um because of the terry fox story and the uh the relatability to sarcoma and and kind of how he left a young family behind that gave me real perspective around life so when i when i do my performances he's kind of he's on my shoulder he's in that little box going rich remember what i went through remember the times we shared together life's important and take not only just take your opportunities but also uh, understand that we're all on a ticking clock we don't know when that clock's going to stop so why would you waste any time You know what David Goggins does say? He says, some people think that I run for physical fitness. How wrong could they be? Yeah, for sure. And and some people think I run because I'm good at it. I think the reason why I run it's because it that's my method of connection to people and... Um, you know when you're running these 40 marathons what are you thinking about because you've <laughs> got running. a lot of time by yourself there haven't yeah, you yeah and also also there's a lot of a lot of people that love talking about running the last thing you want to be doing is just talking yeah. about running for for that time I think it's more obviously I did it for charity so I did it for Sarcoma UK uh, and and some other charities as well um, also awareness of the the charity so it was a very small charity at the time now it's uh, multi-million uh, pound raising charity that's having a massive impact on the uh, environment for cancer sufferers in the UK whether that's uh, treatment whether that's research so to be part of that's massive and when you're kind of going through those dark moments where you you can't be asked to get up in the morning and you've got some people that are running with you that just want to talk about running and all you want to do is you just want to get through the day and go back to bed those kind of moments again are going life's, life's not not tough for me at all it's um there's a lot of people out there that are worse off than, than myself and you're doing it for those that maybe their their clock their their time is coming to an end or um they've not got a lot of time left on earth and 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 presenting them with the best experiences they can in life before before they've got none and I've worked. I've worked in Syria, Jordan, uh, Turkey with MSF and some other charities around conflict, 
and when you see conflict at in in real life when you're in the hospital seeing like general members of public having their legs and arms amputated because of conflict it puts into perspective how lucky we are here and how fortunate i am as a person to be able to um, do what i do um and and hopefully people take something from my performances whether it's about high level performance and the ability to perform under stress or it's whether it just motivates people to to make use of time on this planet look it's really powerful what you've said there really resonating we don't value life until something happens sometimes and there is a ticking clock out there and you did your 40 marathons in 40 days you probably you had those dark days yourself you're Olympic gold medalist. You've, I mean, just tell us all of your key achievements, all of them. Um, how many? How many Olympic medals? How well, many world well, medals? Well, I've, um, world so I've got so I've got four, four, four Paralympic medals, two gold, two silver, uh, four times world champion, four times European champion. Um, I've run seventy nine marathons all over the world, um, including like, ultra marathons in South Africa I think my when I look at my major achievements major, my first major achievement was was my first marathon in 2004 in New York where I chose to accept that I wasn't happy where I was at that time I was kind of going down that going partying too much just kind of yeah working but not kind of working to pay the bills not working for to have an impact you're 26 27 year old like yeah that. yeah exactly and and kind of just paying the bills off starting to pay the mortgage off and saw saw people around me doing exactly the same thing and didn't feel it was maximizing who i was and then i was like right it's t- the time's right to to run this marathon and yeah was tough no preparation uh five hours 19 minutes it took me and i finished that marathon going i'm never going to do that again it's it's like hardest thing i've ever done but then when i came home and really reflected on my experiences and <laughs> and and then kind of just planned i'll for do the another next. 78 <laughs> yeah that's right yeah but but the i i, I just think that we're in life so comfortable and ve- being vulnerable with our with our our thoughts our challenges physically mentally is an enriching time that supports people around us as well as personally so because of all the work i've done i've now got my own foundation the richard white foundation that works with disabled people in participation employment and education but the sustainable work that we do which it, again is as, as important as the work with people with disabilities is educating the community around people with disabilities about the importance of inclusion so it's the the, the whole ethos of the foundation really is about equality diversity and inclusion and that's what we need to be really working on. We need to have more inclusive environments for people to shine and, and have that platform for success. And and those those business owners, those CEOs, those directors that are listening and watching, utilize the resource that's outside that window. There is people that you're not reaching. 16 million people in the UK have a disability. There's people that you're not reaching because you're not diverse enough in your thought process around how these individuals are going to support performance. People with disabilities are having challenges within their lives every day of their life before they even get out the door. Do and you... those challenges are that those those kind of those those people are the ones that are breaking down barriers with within life within challenges wow well said by the way seriously well said now uh, one of my mentors frank that you might know frank he's operated in the world of athletics a, a long time um uh, he says 
when you experience um, a lot of resistance, sometimes failure, sometimes losing, and this kind of thing, at young age, it's good, it's builds you. Maybe disabled people are just have got an innate resilience that's been developed just because it has been so tough and you can you do develop resilience as well a resilience for me is something that we all talk about how i need to be more resilient i need to yeah. uh, but what is that it's not tangible you can't go out to the shops and buy resilience it's great isn't it it's yeah great. and i was never i was never uh, brought up with a silver spoon in my mouth. I was from a working class background, and that definitely helped the ability to understand what resilience is about. Going through those real tough times of struggle, mental, physically, overcoming uh, discrimination around the possibilities of people with disabilities. But we all have challenges. We all have anxieties. We all have times of depression. But why do we shy away from those times? And like I said before, we all, we, we all have debilitating times where we'll have a connection, an interconnection with disability or debilitating times. So why do we not interconnect with the disability community as business? And that's something that, that I'm passionate about moving forwards into into my life it connecting with more more businesses around well, how how we bridge that gap but also maximize the resource maybe there's never been a better time to do that you know with all of the changes in the way that hybrid working is taking place etc and you know up to up to date generally businesses might be missing a trick how many disabled people did you say there 60 was million 60 16 16 million yeah. people out there they're incredibly resilient incredibly yeah. capable they might even be able to do 40 marathons in 40 <laughs> days you never know out of all of your achievements which is the greatest the one that you're most proud of and it, it doesn't have to be sport no I've, I've got two kids so um having my kids and uh, and seeing life through their eyes is, is something that i'm really proud about um what are the names sarah and andrew um and They've just had the birthdays, so eleven and nine, um, which is yeah, it, it's fantastic to be a father uh, and the responsibility of that. And do I push them into sport, or I I, I want them to find their own ways in life. Uh, I see parents and coaches mm-hmm. pushing their their kids into into the same kind of life that they had. And or maybe living mm-hmm. living their life through the kids' eyes, and I just want my, my kids to express themselves through through life and enjoy life as as best they can. And sporting wise, I think obviously twenty twelve is going to be something that I'll I kind of live and die with for the next probably thirty or forty years. I um, yeah, a lot of people talk about that, but um, when you stood on that podium, what were the emotions that were going through you? Yeah, the only the only national anthem that 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 session, <laughs> having my all my family and friends there, um, in the stadium, people that have supported me in my life, the highs and the lows, really powerful. Simon, my friend that 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 died of sarcoma, his his widow and his kids were there, and some of my work colleagues that worked in the the school at the time. It just it really resonated that it was a great opportunity and um but also understand that it's their performance as well as mine and and not having that self-gratifying moment of going yeah this is all me it was more of a a moment for the people and yeah i'm very thankful to have those was i was i in the right time at the right place i don't think so i think i think it was it was a manufactured moment by having the right people around you and I just took full advantage of it. You did. You took your opportunity. Uh, wh- what was it? Man of the hour? Uh, come of the hour. Come, come of the, the hour. Come of the hour. Come <laughs> of the moment. There you go. Yeah. Uh, should get that one printed out. All right. So if, if the listeners should take one action, having listened to this podcast right now, what should it be? An action for you should really be to understand what their why is and their why should be being better every day 
I have five things every day that I have that I go through at home. Things like being thankful, things like maybe a, a little bit of a an activity that I do at home. Um, maybe read some uh, some new content that is totally diverse to who I am. And at the end of the day, I when I brush my teeth, I kind of evaluate the day. Keep things very simple mm. to your why. Don't have this. I want to be the next TikTok millionaire. It's it's not relative, uh, and in some cases, not achievable. Uh, for me, it's about relative whys that you can achieve. Small achievable goals. Enjoy the journey, and then you'll get to the end goal as that gold medalist like I was in 2012. But enjoy the moment because money is not the the main factor in the process. It's about the memories to get to where you go. Be better today than you were yesterday. What, what yeah, what a great way to finish. Almost finish. See, my favourite bit, there's a lot of things in here. Data driven planning, very, very powerful. Don't do enough, do everything. I like what you said there about we yeah, don't value the tank. Yeah. we don't value life until something happens. But my my favourite bit is that is the traits of of the leader, calmness, professionalism, deliver under any circumstances, relatable, know your team, know your people and know every moving cog that is in there. For sure. And what what's been your favourite part? I I think knowing that I I can do I can do what I want in life and whether you've got a disability or not um, it just adds value and I think performance for me has different aspects in it and it's all through the the, the end user's eyes um, that's why in certain cases kind of being this one direction or oh yeah I've 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 watched, I've listened, I've spoke to this person and that really relates to me. But understanding we're all different and performance takes different twists and turns. Don't be driven by performance goals and aspirations that are very static. Try and be dynamic with those performance goals because you will grow in that process. And whether you've been in business performance lifestyle for 20 30 40 years there's always things you can develop and learn and that's what i'm finding now that i'm continually growing to my performance destination and my performance destination won't be a deal won't be a gold medal i feel it will be real enrichment of going actually i've done the best that i can do and i've emptied the tank Richard Wyatt, thank you very much. Hey there, James here with an exciting announcement. The BizX Awards is coming to the ACC Liverpool from the 18th to the 19th of April with an incredible lineup of speakers. You're going to meet the likes of Stephen Mulhern, Donald Miller, Deborah Meaden, and many, many more. Book your spot right now at thebizx.co.uk. And if you've enjoyed listening to the Business Excellence Podcast, make sure to comment your top learnings and favourite moments as well as like and subscribe. See you next time.